Okay, so ordinal partition theory is a rather offbeat branch of mathematics. Um, but before we talk about that, I want to just go back and remind us why we're formalizing mathematics in the first place. So when you look at the history of mathematics, it's actually clear that people have been pushing in this direction from the very beginning. So Euclid, his main contribution is not so much new work as consolidating the existing work in geometry. I, I heard maybe hundreds of schools of Greek geometry under a single axiomatic system. Uh, in the 19th century, you had work on eliminating infinitesimals, giving us the horrid epsilon delta arguments, which are, however, rigorous. Um, later in that century, people like Cantor, uh, now it's worth reminding everyone that Cantor did not just wake up one day and say, I'm going to invent set theory because I'm obnoxious. But he was working on real problems that were giving him kind of unpleasant sets of real numbers. And that is where it all emerged from. So you had um, these people, as I said, Cantor, Frege, trying to get to grips with these concepts of sets that they needed to do more ordinary mathematical work. And finally, you had Zermilo put it on an axiomatic basis. And then into the 20th century, you had the crisis of the paradoxes. And you had people like Whitehead and Russell um, trying to build a very, very formal mathematical world. And I guess Bourbaki, I don't know, quite know if that counts. But again, they, they did their mathematics in a super formal style. And not everyone likes it. Uh, but this, incidentally, all of these people were mathematicians. So the impetus to formalize or to be rigorous came from mathematicians themselves. Um, and finally, with de Bruyne, we have the beginnings of automating mathematics on computer. Um, and then further projects such as Mizar, that was also driven by mathematicians. So now we understand, we accept that essentially all mathematics as it is done today is formalizable. So if I can digress a moment longer, I think in the beginning, or for a long time, there was a little bit of magic in the way mathematics was done. People like Euler did things they weren't really allowed to do, but they got the right answer anyway. So everyone said what a genius they were. If he'd got wrong answers, he probably would have been forgotten. I mean, you don't remember someone who, even as an idiot, you don't remember what an idiot that guy was. You, you just forget him. OK, so. I mean, I'd, I'd change the position of the word essentially and say that all mathematics is essentially formalizable. Because if, if you had something that wasn't formalizable in principle, then I don't think it would count as a piece of math. Well, yeah, you could argue. Well, you should look at the quote on this actual page. This is why I gave this to you. Now, de Bruyne wrote this in 1968. Um, we do not possess a definition of the word mathematics. That's interesting. Um, but I think he's not wrong. And then he points out the way mathematical reasoning goes. They, they go from calculations into intuitions, which are very clear to them. Uh, the intuitions which are perhaps justified by rigorous thinking, but it's completely outside their formalism. Then they go back into their formalism. And um, I think it's very prescient of de Bruyne to see at the very outset that this might be done. So there really is a lot of mathematics which perhaps is not formalizable. Um, and yet we have a lot of experience now. and. Generally, everything we try, we just keep working at it, we do it. Now, just to remind you, we are using simple type theory here. So uh, just to remind you where it came from, it came from Whitehead and Russell. They, their Principia Mathematica, in which they tried to formalize so much mathematics, had a thing called ramified type theory, but the ramification bit didn't really work. And so they added another axiom, which canceled it. Um, which sounded very silly. And this then evolved into higher order logic, which has been implemented in various systems, including, of course, Isabel. 
And just to remind you what Isabel offers us, um, simple type theory augmented with axiomatic type classes, which are quite a useful addition, but they are only do work on the, on the level of types. Um, a lot of automation, a very nice proof language so we can read our proofs, a nice development environment, um, reasonably good mathematical symbols and so on, the ability to generate LaTeX output so you can typeset things. And the number of, I don't even, I think that needs updating, but there are a lot of proof developments. I think it's probably over 700 by now, but if it isn't now, it will be eventually. Okay, now a remark about set theory, because the example I'm doing does belong to set theory. So I should point out that higher order logic is weaker than Zermilo set theory. So not Zermilo Frankel. So Zermilo Frankel is the giant system which people use today and which they are typically adding on extra bits. It's a bit like, I don't know, Elon Musk asking for a trillion dollars more when you've already got unlimited stuff. I, and the more I look at formalization, the more I see how inexhaustible and how utterly vast Zermilo Frankel set theory is. So higher order logic is weaker than Zermilo set theory, which is a very tiny chunk of ZF set theory. So we cannot do set theory in higher order logic directly, except we can cheat simply by adding these Zermilo Frankel axioms for a particular type. So we basically m magic for ourselves a type of Zermilo Frankel sets um, with the normal Zermilo Frankel axioms. Um, and suddenly we have a system which incorporates set theory. The nice thing, I won't talk about it here because I don't have time. Uh, the, the nice thing and the uh, in fact difficult but important thing is integrating this smoothly with the rest of higher order logic so you wouldn't want to have to construct the real numbers again in set theory. <coughs> but we can set things up so that the already existing type of real numbers can be mapped into a set, a corresponding set in ZF. And then we can say, yes, we have real numbers. Its cardinality is um, two to the cardinality of uh, um, L of zero and so on. OK, we have AC and we can't eliminate it. So I'm very sorry. If you're an AC hater, you are out of luck. Or even if you want to prove equivalence of the axiom of choice, you are still out of luck. <coughs> So once we assume the ZF axioms, we can develop everything. So we have our ordinals and cardinals and all that stuff. Right, so now we start getting on to the meat of the subject. So this is Ramsey's theory. I hope everyone's heard of Ramsey's theorem, which in the finite case, they say yes. You have a graph. Uh, you consider the complete graph on a set of vertices. So not just any graph, a complete graph. Um, and then you imagine coloring all the edges, let's say red or blue, and then Ramsey's theorem tells you that um, if you want to have a guarantee of a clique colored all the same color, what they call monochromatic, um, let's say of size n, there is some Ramsey number which is some incredibly gigantic thing such that any complete graph of that bigger size is guaranteed to have a uniformly colored clique of the size you specified. So that is a finite case. Uh, we can generalize this in various ways to the transfinite case. So this notation here, uh, alpha, arrow, beta, gamma, now those Greek letters are no denoting set theoretic ordinals. Uh, as for n, n equals 2. For <laughs> n is the um, the size of the set. So if you would give the usual example of edges on a graph, n equals 2. Um, if you want to deal with hypergraphs, and basically a hypergraph is where you're interested in finite sets of some fixed larger size, like 3 or whatever, um, then you'd use the cases for larger n. And in fact, Ramsey's theorem, I think, is only really cool when you would let n go up higher and higher, but not for, not for now. So n is 2, and so we are considering, as before, um, the complete graph 
But this time, alpha will typically be an infinite ordinal. Now remember, an ordinal is, in set theory is a set of all its smaller ordinals. So we've got a big set, an infinite set. We imagine now a complete graph on this infinite set of vertices. And we again imagine coloring all the edges. And now these Ramsey properties will say, let's say you've got red and blue as your colors, that there is either an all red clique of size beta or an all blue clique of size gamma. So, so far it's exactly like Ramsey's theorem, except what do I mean by size? I am not referring to the cardinality here, so just to be awkward, the size is referring to order type. So if you have a set of ordinals, the, the, the normal ordering on the ordinals is um, typically going to behave in a rather weird way, which we characterize by the order type and order types are themselves ordinals, and so it's saying either there will be, let's say, an all red clique, where if you look at all the, um, I guess the ordinals, uh, it, that, are in the, that make up the clique, that set of ordinals will have order, order type beta, or else a blue clique, again, the set of ordinals in that clique would have order type gamma. So that's what this symbol all this talk was explaining the first line of the slide there. Um, well, actually, <coughs> the rest of the slide is also what I said. And by the way, the infinite Ramsey theorem, if you have heard of it, can be written using this notation uh, with the um, bottom line of the slide. That says if I have any simply infinite, just like the set of natural numbers, so a graph where the vertices are the set of natural numbers, we are guaranteed to find either a red or a blue um, clique in that graph that will um, also have the size, have, it all has to be, is infinite because an infinite set of natural numbers is guaranteed to have order type omega. Anyway, I must continue. So Erdos, being a strange person, got very interested in this, even though it doesn't relate to anything important. So he said, when, what are, how can we characterize these? Now, the first thing here, so alpha arrow alpha 2, that is trivial because 2 is a single edge. So if you have a graph, uh, and the question is whether there is a single blue edge, well, either there is, or if there are no blue edges and all the edges are red, so of course the whole thing is a clique of, uh, of the red. So that's a trivial case. Um, now the thing in red there, so that ordinal alpha to cardinality of alpha plus one or omega, uh, there is a construction, I won't do it here, but there is a relatively straightforward construction that is a counterexample to this, so that fails. So Erdos being Erdos, he decided that this was a very important problem. And he said, just for countable ordinal alpha, what about um, alpha arrow alpha 3? Now, you might think if 2 is trivial, 3 can't be that hard. But it seems to be that the case for 3 is as difficult as the case for any finite n. Certainly, the, the proofs that were exhibited for 3 later were generalized a little bit and covered any finite end. And if you think of it, what is a three clique? It's just <laughs> three points with, line, with edges around them, and it's hard to know why. But And <coughs> there are some other proof that, that this alpha has to be a power of omega. So finally, Erdos offered $1,000. I don't know where he got the money from. I think usually it's when he won a prize. Instead of spending the money on wine, women, and song, he would give it away to other mathematicians. OK, now I just want to mention, uh, I'm going to, I mean, this stuff is mind-numbingly technical and dry. So I'm not going in much detail, but I just want to show you the results that were formalized. Uh, and this, by the way, in collaboration with Angeliki here and with Myrna, can't pronounce her last name. Um, do you know how to pronounce her last name, Angeliki? Damonja or something. Yeah, something like that. Okay, so we see those results there. There's something for omega squared for arbitrary m, a finite 
am, of course. Um, the next line down, the most horrible exponents by Erdos and not the famous Milner, but another one. And the last one, which is the one we're looking for, which is omega, omega to the omega, um, going to omega to the omega, or again, any finite m. <coughs> and a lot of other stuff needed to be formalized for this to work, including the notion of cantonormal form and a thing called the Nash-Williams partition theorem. So while I said, I will try and go through the highlights of this without putting people to sleep too much. So I mentioned the Erdos and Milner result, and that, just formalizing that paper was a big effort already. <coughs> um, so this paper is five pages long. It ought to be easy. So I know Shemaretti's regularity lemma was presented over five pages. And it was pretty straightforward once we figured out what the subset symbol meant for them um, and how to deal with the degenerate cases that they didn't bother to mention. But once we figured that out, it was completely straightforward. But as for this paper, as I said, it's five pages long. <coughs> the main lemma is right here. And the material highlighted in yellow is the material that was wrong and had to be corrected in a subsequent paper. So, and the, the yellow, I mean, that is basically the whole proof is actually wrong. It's not like really, really wrong. Um, I, I think some of the subscripts were a little off or something like that. I, I didn't find these errors, by the way, and there's no way I could have. Um, but somebody went to the trouble of reading the paper and maybe must have written to one of the authors. Okay. Now, I want to go through at least some of the stages of this proof um, without too much detail. So one of the claims, they define a thing called a strong type. Um, so they have a notion of order type which goes beyond ordinals, which I've actually never understood. But luckily, the, for what I needed, I only needed the ordinals. So they have a thing they call a strong type, and I had to prove that every ordinal was a strong type. And this was not a thing they proved, because they were just assuming strong types. And I think it was trivial to them. So why bother? Um, they made a remark. The remark may have been a sentence or half a sentence. You can never be sure. Um, and then the main lemma. So this main lemma is the thing that was wrong in the first version. And as you can see, the statement of this lemma is um, a little complicated. In fact, they have, so this symbol here, they have the minimum of two different uh, ordinal expressions. So that is getting a bit complicated. And finally, the main theorem. Now the main theorem, amazingly, was straightforward. And then one last thing. So Larson didn't use the theorem in the form. They proved it. She needed a consequence of it. Um, it's kind of an interesting thing when you look at it. And maybe this was what the starting point in all her work. So if you remember, she wanted omega to the omega arrows, omega to the omega, or some arbitrary k. And here you have a weaker property here, but one that she presumably saw as a route to proving this thing. Actually, to be precise, I think her contribution is a greatly simplified version of a proof by another person. So let's have a quick look at this. Um, just to show you what the kind of material looks like here. Oh, it's interesting that I see they're using this strict subset relation for a non-strict subset here as well. Yeah, it gets quite fiendish. So um, a lot of these things are left very vague. So I believe, for example, that B denotes an arbitrary set of order type beta. And it's a bit like if any of you have programmed in Fortran and you know that letters from I to N are automatically have type integer. The entire paper was written with all kinds of conventions of that sort. So you have these technical conditions on um, types, and they're using beta to range over order types, which are more general concepts of ordinal. 
So those two properties there, which I forgot, I think they relate to Cantor normal form. I'm just showing you that's what the proof, that's part of the, but by no means the whole proof. I think I said it took 200 lines. Um, so that was my first remark. Second one. Um, ah, here is the remark. So a remark about indecomposable ordinals. By the way, an ordinal is indecomposable if it is not possible to express it as the sum of two smaller ordinals. So they made this claim, and I just see it's just a sentence. Well, exactly what it means, I'm not sure anymore, but the various A sets all have order type alpha, and alpha is indecomposable. So they made that little remark, which is kind of obvious if you are in the mood of this. I know it's not obvious to any of us, even not to me, having done this. Um, this took 72 lines, and there I'm simply showing you what it looked like. The thing I would like people to take away, though, is although this stuff is kind of gruesome, you can at least read it a little bit so we have the assumptions. Alpha is indecomposable, it's greater than one. The set A has order type alpha. Um, a is a set of ordinals and so on, on and on. And then you can see as you go through the proof text that you can see there, like a third of the way down, a function phi is being defined and so on and so forth. So at least there are some times. Well, what's, what's the last little bit mean? So single than x less than a2? I uh, say define the special. I believe that means that every element of the first set is smaller than every element of the I second set. Right. Yeah. Um, this is the main lemma. This, this um, which was 900 or so lines. And I even made a little remark to myself, please excuse the omission of further detail, which I have entirely forgotten. Uh, it's a part of one's life that maybe one wants to just forget ever happened. But this is the outline of the proof. So we're trying to show for every um, thing of size alpha beta, then uh, we have the Ramsey property with the smaller of those two ordinals, or 2k, provided the ordinal alpha has that other Ramsey property shown there. And in, but roughly speaking, the steps of the proof are first, you looking at this is your uh, this is talking about your alpha beta um, graph there, assuming there are no blue cliques. Then assuming there are no red cliques of, si of, of size gamma, and then show there must be a red clique of this size omega beta. So that is the rough structure of this 900 line proof. Um, and again, this is only a teeny tiny bit, but at least we have some idea that there is some structure there and some things are being shown so um, Now this is a kind of unpleasant thing. Equation eight. This is the sort of thing that really makes you want to punch your computer <laughs> because, okay, it is so obvious. Um, how many lines? Fifty. I see my my notes say. This was mostly routine. It is still 50 lines long. So we are somehow grinding through all the consequences of these things in a very painful way. And the main theorem, and all of these, you know, I copied out of the paper itself. Um, so that's three lines. This was not too bad. So this is meant to be a kind of obvious mathematical induction, I think. Uh, in fact, I think it even holds for h equals 0, which makes it even easier. So this is the induction. And I think, lo and behold, I managed to fit the entire proof on a slide. So that three lines blew up into this. Um, I'm actually happy with that one. OK. 
So that's Erdos and Milner. Now we move to Larson's paper, which is the main goal of the work. Again, she is proving this Ramsey property. Um, ah, yes, the original proof by Chang, who took 56 pages, and I see he got into combinatorial theory, series A, because it's Ramsey theory, and it is not graph theory, which is like, boom. Um, probably Chang proved it for M equal to three, and Milner then generalized it for arbitrary. And this shows you, and these guys say, as you dedicated how many years of your life from generalizing it from three to M? But that's the same, I mean, that's Ross theorem, right? It's the same thing happened there. <coughs> Okay, so Larson um, simplified this paper very dramatically. It is still not a simple proof. Um, I just want to show you a few things so you have an idea what kind of things we're working with. So we are making sets of various order types. So we're dealing with these sequences. Um, does this work? Ah, uh, yes, the set. The set of all finite sequences of their natural numbers. Ah, uh, yes. The set of all finite sequences of natural numbers uh, of length n. Sorry, not finite sequences. All sequences of length n of natural numbers, lexicographically ordered, will obviously have order type omega to the n. Then you take the union of all of them, and you have a set of order type omega to the omega, and this gives you a hint where we're getting started here. So now she's going to do the Ramsey work on this set W. So given a two coloring of a the complete graph on this set W, um, assume there are no blue cliques of size n. So finite, there's no finite blue cliques, then there must be a red colored clique, which is of this big order type omega to the omega. So that is the strategy. Now I think I will skip through some of these definitions because they are just horrendous, but I think it's useful to look at them. Now the asterisk here is concatenation of sequences. So she is joining sequences together. Um, in various weird ways. So there she's making, she's calculating other sequences out of the lengths of these sequences um, to make more things. So I have given, you're given, I mean, this is, this is kind of crazy because if I have a sequence of natural numbers, one could imagine many ways that you could see it as a concatenation of smaller sequences of natural numbers. Um, and then you can imagine forming these things on here, the absolute values uh, symbol actually refers to the length of these sequences. And from those lengths, we are generating more sequences. And finally, she calculates, she defines this thing um, called the interaction scheme. And I think that what makes it all work is that the integers have to be disjoint, and that thing at the bottom has to be strictly ordered. No, that has to be strictly in increasing order, um, which, although it's not at all obvious that this can be done uniquely, but in fact it can be. So she, I don't even think she bothered to say it could be done uniquely. Maybe it was just obvious to her. Um, so this somehow is relating these two finite sequences of natural numbers. Um, God, this last remark is horrifying. So by the fiendish result that we just saw, it somehow follows that x, is, the length of x is less than the x of y, but I have no idea how. And just to add to the fun, you might notice the round brackets here. What are they about? Well, oops, sorry, let me go back. Um, What are they about? We have two versions of this. So we have it with and without 
the bracketed material. So I'm just giving you I an idea of the, the kind of mind-numbing guff, and we've only got started. Um, before I can continue with Larson, we briefly need to mention a thing called the Nash-Williams Partition Theorem. I'm not going to prove it here. It can also be seen as a generalization of Ramsey's theorem, in this case the finite Ramsey's theorem. Um, do, I, do I even want to say exactly how this is related? Um, I guess the finite Ramsey's theorem is concerned with finite sets on generalizing from graphs to hypergraphs. The hypergraphs would basically involve finite sets all of the same size. Here we are generalizing it so that the finite sets do not all have the same size, provided they have this property of being thin, which means that one set is not an initial segment of another. Um, I don't need to go into this in detail, but basically this is another monochromatic type property for, um, I guess, these sets of finite sets. And if I got that wrong, I'm very sorry, but you can look it up. Okay, let's go back to Larson. So Larson's argument goes through three lemmas, and I just want to show you the lemmas and some of the material in them. So, and we're not going to read this because this, this as I said, is really, really mind-numbing. I think it is much harder to make any sense of, in fact, than, let's say, the Shemaretti stuff, which has these nice natural properties where the energy of a craft goes down. You know, that's straightforward. Here you have I mean, functions in a sequence, then something exists, and then something else exists, and finally something else exists. So I'm not going to go through the details of those, but let's just see some of the things that are involved here. So that is a relatively easy one at 150 lines, and this follows from the Nash-Williams theorem. Um, 900 lines, 900 lines is really kind of painful. Uh, and there's a lot of hairy stuff going on there. This is where I had that mistake for so long. <coughs> but not to be outdone at 1700 lines, this is really horrendous. And one of the painful things was when Larson just threw up a set and said, I believe, and this is clearly order, order type omega to the omega, to which my reply was, you think? Or it looked like two weeks for me to figure out a strategy for proving that it might be true. Okay, finally, here is the full text of the main theorem. That is the proof of the main theorem. And again, this is relatively easy. And I guess it's a nice property that these guys are in the habit of putting all the hard work in the lemmas so that the main theorem is not too bad. Again, I wouldn't particularly try and figure out what the hell this is saying. I just want to show you that this is not trivial stuff. Okay. Now, you might want to say, why are we getting such big blow-ups? Um, certainly, as it says here, some people write in more detail than others. In fact, Larson is in many places quite detailed, but when you throw out a thing like an order type, it's obviously that. Um, she wasn't wrong, and I guess an expert would just see it, but even if you see it, um, I mean, a genius, a mathematician is perhaps a genius when they can see a thing is true long before they have a proof of it. And maybe they don't even bother to really prove it because it's so obvious why prove it. Uh, and the amazing thing is that sometimes when they do write down a proof and the proof is wrong, although the proof is wrong, the thing is still true. And that is real genius because we normally think that you do the proof and then you know a thing is true, when that is not how it works in practice at all. <coughs> um, I should add, if you compute, whenever you compute the de Bruyne factor, you know, the factor of blow up, in the official way by compressing documents and so on, you get much smaller numbers. So it may be also that there's not a lot in each of these lines. A lot of them are keywords like proof and QED, uh, and they give you a blow up by measured by line, which is not so big if you compute this, the blow up in other ways. Now I just want to show you the kind of things we're looking at here. 
Now, I told you before not to study things, but why don't you try and figure this out and then see how long before you start banging your head on the desk in front of you. Um, I mean, it looks like it ought to be easy. Um, but somehow, once you get into the double subscripts and figuring out, I got to keep that the sequence be defined in the order that follows and so on. And by the way, <coughs> this is the reversal of the subscripts at the very last one. See, they're all going one to m, one to n. And then at the last one, they're going from n down to one. And I really was quite lazy, but you know, we were locked down with COVID and I was sitting in the chair and my eyesight is not so good when you're in your mid 60s <laughs> to see this sudden and see, oh yeah, they're going up and up and up and that last one's going, which by the way, makes it a lot harder to formalize. If you're going to formalize this thing, you say, oh, when you get to the top, you have to do it in the other order. Um, that's pretty gruesome. So that's all I'm going to say on Larson. Now, I could have given you much more, but I hope I proved my point. This is technically highly difficult material. Um, if anyone cares about this result, it's nice to know that it has been formalized because if there's an error in anything, there would be an error in this kind of thing. Right, what else have we done? Well, here's a list. I should thank Angeliki for helping me update this list with some of our later stuff. I'm not going to say what all of these things are. I'm not even sure myself, but some of these are regarded as really quite important results. Isn't that right, Angeliki? Um, so the Roth theorem here is not the Roth theorem, but it's still an important theorem, I think. Um, and the book Modular Functions and Dirichlet Series is a graduate level number theory book. I think we formalized four or five chapters of it. And I have to mention Grothendieck schemes because Buzzard always says, why haven't they formalized schemes? And so we've done them, but we st I have no clue why they're there, why they're interesting, um, and why anyone would want them, but clearly there are people out there who do want them. Um, so, I'm about to finish, but uh, before we do, I want to make a major point. As I've said before, when you see a simple claim, like the order type of this set is such and so, which is obvious to a mathematician, and in that particular case took me at least two weeks to prove, and I think there was one attempt that I struggled over and then threw away and tried to do it a different way. Um, you might say, well, it's completely useless. If you're going to try and do real mathematics in this thing, if all kinds of obvious stuff is going to take you weeks and weeks. But the thing is, I think there's an approach one can use even now um, because we have a wonderful thing called sorry. And sorry means I don't feel like proving this at the moment. Now you might say, what is the point of formalizing mathematics if you're going to use sorry? And the point is, the things that you believe, you don't have to formalize their proofs, at least not immediately. It's the things you're not sure about that you need to formalize. So you could imagine, as a mathematician doing original work, typing in your development, all the steps of it that you know, are new, that are somehow technically difficult, type them in. When you get to the obvious things, you just put a sorry underneath, and you can continue until you have got to the things you know, where the really the critical phase comes. Um, and then if you can get through that, you can say, right, well, I'm satisfied. Maybe you could even quit at that point and say, okay, I've checked it. I'm not going to waste another month or two to, to fill in all the trivial details. Or if you are senior enough, you might give it to a graduate student. But that's not a nice thing to do. Um, so I think even today, people could use tools like this to formalize, to actually assist the work of a real mathematician. Now, I just have a last few remarks. Um, things that other, this is a thing that Tom Hales recommended, formalizing definitions 
The great thing about definitions is you don't have to prove anything. You just have to type them in correctly. That already can be a lot of work. And of course, if you do it wrong, as I say, this is a limitation, uh, frankly, of some of the type theory systems where because of intentional equality, um, I think the precise form of a definition can be very committal um, so that a mathematically equivalent definition might not, in fact, be usable. You know, you can't convert from one to another, even if they're mathematically equivalent, which means you really have to get it right the first time. I think we're finding it a little easier in simple type theory that <coughs> as long as the definition is right, the precise form of it is not particularly important. You can then prove equivalent versions later. So you can type in definitions without having to prove stuff. And at least the big library of definitions is a starting point for doing further work. And then, as I just said hand-wavingly five minutes ago, formalize the skeleton of the proof, leaving out the obvious bits. Um, we also, I haven't mentioned it, but Isabel has a very cool counterexample checker. And if you still remember, the proof I just showed you was about sequences of natural numbers and had some really fiendish technical definitions of things. And there were indeed plenty of times when if I wasn't sure about a thing, I could put in a lemma that I was thinking of proving and I could give it to the counterexample checker first. And it would say, nope, nope. That's wrong, you know, and this is a great time saver. So what we, are, what we have, what we have already is what I would call a careful, definitely a painstakingly careful assistant. They were even 20 or 30 years ago, but now they are much more usable than ever before. So you can do it now. Okay, and thank you.